I'd like to formally open the Brosser Assessment Panel this evening. I welcome panel members. On behalf of panel members, I welcome council staff and other people who are here with us. Attendance, all members are present. There are no apologies. Confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 2nd of June, 2020. Any questions raised as to production of the minutes? Somebody like to move? Move Deidre. Seconded, Grant. Any discussion? I put the minutes. Minutes are received. Business arising from the minutes. There are none arising from the minutes. Declaration of interest by any member of the panel in any matter being discussed this evening. Yes, Richard. Yes, I have a conflict of interest on 7.1. 7.1. Okay, we'll deal with that when we... We now move to application for consideration tonight. Our first application is 6.1. The applicant is Sorby Adams Wines. Proposal is addition to existing winery, construction of a finished goods storage shed, 33.4 metres by 12 metres, 12.4 metres by 6.128 metres wall height, and construction of a canopy joining the two winery buildings and installation of a rainwater tank. It's located at 759 Light Pass Road, Anguston. It's in a primary production zone, Barossa Valley region. It was a merit application, it was category three, and it was given public notification, and four representations were received. Two of the persons who lodged representations indicated that they wished to address the panel. We'll now have what's called a hearing of representation. That gives those people who wish to address the panel an opportunity to arrest the panel. Just before we proceed on that, I'll point out, of course, your written representations, all of them that were received, have been circulated and read by the panel members. Now, those persons who are going to address the panel have five minutes to wish to address the panel. At the conclusion of your address, the panel members may wish to ask you questions, which you also may wish to respond to. Once we've heard those people who are going to address the panel, the applicant will be given an opportunity to respond. The applicant will be given 10 minutes in which to respond to those questions. I might also point out that um, after the, we've gone through this process, uh, that will be the end of any uh, uh, reaction between the panel and other people who are here except the applicant. We may, as we do our discussion on the application, ask the applicant further questions. But I do notice that with the representors, there is actually one person representing a number of people. And I'll ask uh, Eleanor Walker to do that on behalf of... Uh, now, that's the two, pe two persons? Good. Now, you do have some extra time for that. I'll give you uh, eight minutes in which to address the panel. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'll make sure I speak nice and loud. Yes. Um, so, as you've um, mentioned, I've been engaged by two of the adjacent landowners. Um, but directly above the site, one to the east and one to the north, um, being 747 and 747A, like Pass Road um, in Vineville. Both my clients, incidentally, have the same concerns about the proposed winery additions, um, which I'll explain um, in more detail from, um, and just pick up in a little bit more detail based on the response to the representations from the planning consultant. Um, so we understand that the existing winery was approved by the panel as a non-complying form of development and that the original use was carefully considered by the panel members as appropriate. Um, neither my clients lodged representation to the original DA um, as one in particular was interstate and the other didn't receive and did not receive notification as a result. Um, and it was also their view, they didn't follow it up as 
their view was that it, the building at the scale that it was originally approved was appropriate setback from boundaries um, and it was understood that this was to be used principally as a barrel store, not a winery. Um, so uh, that's the basis. Um, the fundamental issue is around the intensification of the use um, and, and how that's... Um, and basically, in effect, and what I've put in my submission is that it looks and smells like a fully functioning winery. Um, my clients both work in the wine industry and have done so for most of their working years. Um, my client Kerry was um, on basically the Op Health and Safety Committee for Peter Lemons for 15 years, um, and her roles actually included loading trucks, storing pallets of wine, and forklifting. So she's got a pretty good understanding of the um, mechanics of how how this type of land use operates. So it's one of her responsibilities at Peter Lemons. Um, so we have reviewed the response to the representations and still have a number of concerns, as I've mentioned, about the intensity of the land use on a site with no graps. So fundamentally, um, one of our concerns in terms of the the land use being a departure from the intent of the primary production zone is that there is, this is quite a substantial operation now and there's absolutely no viticulture on the site. Whilst we acknowledge that there's bushfires proposed to be planted, um, in our view it's, it's a bit of a token gesture um, and certainly is not something that would support such a large operation. I'll add to that in that you know, my, my clients are obviously in the wine industry and they live in the section of the valley that um, wineries are, are normal, where they actually are located is right down the end of White Pass as you turn around the bend, and it's quite a quiet little pocket. Um, so we've got basically some concerns around amenity um, on such a small, a pretty big winery on such a small site. Um, Council submits that the proposed land use will not be further intensified. However, I'm of the view that this is not correct, as the barrel storage capacity is increasing from 170 barrels to 320 barrels of pallets, basically. Um, this previously approved winery building is substantially in scale in its own right and has an overall height of six metres, which is consistent with the scale of many wineries that we've approved in the Barossa. The inclusion of a large canopy area and additional winery building will substantially increase the storage capacity. Ensuring that the winery buildings are only stacked to a certain um, limit, in my view, will require ongoing enforcement issues from staff. And I'll add to that that there's no um, detail of the actual barrel layer. Ordinarily, when you lodge a DA, um, like I've done in the past, you can actually put the barrel storage and have a section, a sectional detail, and there's none of that that you actually outline um, the layout. Um, in my view, 320 barrels is not insignificant, and essentially 320 barrels of wine equates to the storage of over 10.5 thousand cases of wine, which is um, not, in my view, a small operation. So I've done the counts and spoken to a winemaker several wine makers and it's pretty significant in terms of overall storage and in my view that is a definite intensification. Um, whilst the planning officer report states that the use will not change, the noise generated from the activities associated with a regular delivery of wine, transferring bulk quantities of wine from tank to barrel and the dispatch of large quantities of wine will actually be significant. There's a lot of um, a lot of activity that actually goes on as part of this proposed land use. Um, Council's assessing officers also stated in the assessment report to the panel that, and I quote, thus there may be potential new impacts to the adjacent land users, land users as a result of the increased floor area. Um, unfortunately, and this is one of the crux, the crux of my issues that I have actually raised, is that there's no evidence by a suitably qualified acoustic engineer to demonstrate to the panel that there will be no adverse off-site impacts. Um, neither has, um, neither, as detailed in the letter from the applicant's consultant, has a planning report been submitted with the application for the intensification of this original land use. Um, this is a particular concern as most winery developers within the region, within 
essentially 90 to 100 metres existing dwellings um, require the submission of an acoustic report. So we've got two, we've got a number of sensitive receptors in the locality, and there's no, we don't have any technical basis to um, demonstrate whether it complies with the EPP. Um, I've obviously got quite a number of years' experience with assessing acoustic reports, um, and they actually critique all the activities, as, as everyone's very well aware, um, and it actually breaks down all the land uses and the predicted noise levels. And unfortunately, in this case, we don't have any of that information to be able to make um, an evidence-based um, assessment, in my, in my view. Um, the use involves the noise of forklift movement, truck movements, general operational noise, pumps, um, and therefore, um, in my view, it would be an error not to obtain noise data. Um, it is also unusual that there would be no increase in traffic movements, given that it's almost a 50% increase in storage capacity. Um, and the proposal includes the dispatch of wine. So the argument around um, the need for the increase um, doesn't necessarily wash in terms of no traffic movements. That, had that actually haven't been unpacked properly in, in the submission, um, in my view. Um, and additionally, having sought advice from an experienced winemaker in the Barossa who is experiencing wastewater treatment specifically, um, it appears that the proposed drainage system of the mechanic area has been designed for washdown of solid products. Um, the proposed length and depth of what we call a wing drain is consistent with a production facility rather than incidental spills. Um, it is of our view that the winery infrastructure has been designed to cater for further intensification of use. And my concern is around allowing that base land use of a winery, um, particularly moving into new planning legislation, um, it, it, you know, there's a decision about appropriateness on that site as a winery, irrespective of the extent of operations. Um, my clients are also concerned about the location of the stainless steel tanks, which they are to be used for, which are to be used for the pumping of barrels and tanks so it's not clear where these tanks actually would be located. Um, the additional building and canopy area is said um, to be proposed due to new safe, um, safe or SA requirements. I think this needs to be unpacked and explained a little bit better because I've spoken to a number of different people from various wineries such as Wolf Glass and Oxford Landing mm -hmm. today. Um, and it appears to me that there's a disparate view on, on what those requirements actually are. It depends sometimes on the actual structural load um, of, of the barrel um, racks, basically. Um, so my view is that that needs to be explained a little bit more. And irrespective, we're still going from 170 to 320 barrels. Um, so the most significant issue, irrespective of the extent of the operation, is in my view the significant departure from the extent from the intent of the zone. It, it's difficult. I obviously give a lot of planning advice um, and review a lot of planning advice from council in the Barossa, and there's a pretty consistent view about wineries needing four hectares. And the and PDC four does not distinguish about whether it's for barrel storage or exactly you know, the, the scope of what a winery actually is. It just says, hey, winery, and it says it should be accompanied with at least four hectares. That is applied consistently. In fact, I reviewed written planning advice from council at about 9.30 last night um, with that exact view on a completely separate proposal that basically the proposal wouldn't stack up because it didn't have four hectares. So it, I would respectfully request that the panel consider the policy intent around four hectares. I'll be, I'll be quick. Give me one more minute. All right. Um, now, whilst the zone envisages the um, wineries, the objective of the zone is to demonstrate connection between the use of the land and primary production. PDC 4, as I've said, um, I'll skip over that, I've already said that, but PDC 5 states that the existing winery and industrial uses should only be expanded in association with improvements in A, amenity, B, site access, C, waste management capability. 
and we submit that the expansion does not improve the amenities, there is no evidence that there will be no off-site impacts. I think that's actually a very important PDC for the panel to consider. Um, it should be noted, also noted um, to the panel, my clients do not operate motorsport activities on the site and there is no change in land use as suggested by the planning consultant. The mounds were not developed and then were placed on the site for their kids to practice their riding their motorbikes, riding their motorbikes on when the kids were little. Um, the landscape plan, in my view, is pretty comprehensive and actually a pretty good environmental outcome. However, the, it is a little difficult to read exactly what plant is going where. Um, and we just suggest that it's very clear that native screen plants go along the eastern boundary so that they will decide to approve the development. Um, we submit that the intensification of the use is not consistent with the current production zone and we respectfully request that the panel defer the decision in order to obtain an acoustic report from the experienced acoustic engineer. Um, and lastly, I um, have put together a couple of suggested conditions should the panel um, consider that this land use is appropriate. Um, in the first instance, condition two, um, which talks about the landscaping, um, I think there need, it needs to be clear about when that should be um, commenced. The canopy actually is already constructed and in existence. So it's my view that it's reasonable um, that the landscaping works go in within one month of the date of any consent. Further to that, it, because obviously it was natives are, are going to take to the soil much better, they also take a long time to establish and they take a long time to establish a screen. Um, in my view, landscaping obviously it's a common planning fact that you don't use landscaping to mask an inappropriate development. But it is important that if that is part of the um, solution, that semi-advanced species at least go in along the boundaries, um, in my view. Um, secondly, I've got an issue with condition four, where condition four actually says all winery processing should be undertaken on an impervious area. Now, it's pretty clear that the application is not for winery processing, so I think that needs to be reworded, in my view. Um, I also would suggest that the panel consider a condition um, that states specifically that there shall be no crushing, bottling, etc., um, on the application. So it actually gives council something to enforce. So, in the event that the panel see that this is appropriate, that at least then panel. Um, if they do do what you know is allowed for in the infrastructure of this winery, that there is something that can actually be tangibly enforced by a section 84 notice. Um, and council don't then have to spend too much money enforcing that. Um, and I say that specifically making sure that the canopy area, as shown in the indoors plans, can only be used for loading and unloading of dry goods. No barrel work is committed, should be committed in this area. Um, and no wine production activities should occur. Thank you. Uh, yes. Panel members, do you have any questions? Yes, Rob. Um, just one, you didn't touch on the car parking, so you know, both submissions you said about 17, you're aware it's more back to follow? Yes, I don't have the time. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think the issue is, is that the clients would prefer that the car parking be relocated further away. Um, from the boundary um, and the issue around the access is actually quite a big loop access. There's no real need to have it so close to the boundary. Panel members, any further questions? Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now on behalf of the applicant I'd ask Annie Atkinson to address the panel, and I believe you've got the applicants as well, if there's any questions or anything that they want to say as well, in your 10 minutes. Thank you. I think we were having Peter Goss, who's um, qualified to give noise. Just one moment, I think. Just let me check. If you can speak a little bit loud. I'm, I'm sorry, this is one of the penalties we pay for our current... Uh, uh, right. Problems. I think we were having Peter Goss, an engineer who does acoustic engineering, but he hasn't 
come tonight. Okay. Thank but, you. Uh, Simon will have something to say about what Peter Goss has done to ameliorate the problems of noise within the canopy. Thank you. Um, I don't think I've got much to say except that Council did approve uh, a fully blown winery with crushing and the whole bit of trucks coming in with grapes further along the road on 8,000 square metres. It's the Loose Ends Winery and that has 24% site cover. It's also in the same zone and it's also in um, the landscape preservation area as well. So this is not a first intrusion and it is not a full-blown winery. What it is, is storage and maturation. No crushing, no trucks coming in with grapes. Um, now I also have, I've been 30 years in the viticulture industry myself. I'm a grape grower and I know how the wineries work as well, having taken my grapes into wineries. So that's a bit of my background. Um, there, there shouldn't be any tumbling of noise and I think I've addressed that. It's not a new land use because there are there's a, a small crushing um, winery further along out in the other direction, um, I think it'd be northeast, but it's only a very small operation. So there are two wineries fully blown on either side, even though it's a bit distant. Um, and one, of course, being on 8,000 square metres. Uh, I think pretty much that's why I'm, I'm not too worried about Eleanor's suggestions about condition two and four. There's not going to be any train change in traffic. Um, I don't think there's any departure in this land use from what's already been allowed in the area. There are a lot of small allotments there. This land could never have been used for um, an economic, an economically run vineyard because it's only 1.4 hectares, I think, and nor could the 8,000 8, down the road. So we've got a lot of land parcels on the valley floor, which are in this zone, which can really never be used for vineyards on an economic basis. Um, to have these small allotments zoned for primary production, it's a bit of a problem. The only primary production you could really have is intensive, chook sheds, horticulture, and then you've got spraying problems. So what do we do with these small lots? We've done the best we can. We've kept the buildings to a really nice design, which is complementary to farm sheds, historic shapes and sizes of farm sheds. The colours were selected to blend and a lot of landscaping. We have really gone overboard to get the landscaping in. And following the objections that we had from the four people, uh, we've reduced the new shed, not the canopy, but the new shed by 20% floor area. So we have done these things hoping to help out four objectors. And there's very little more we could do, but we think it's a, a pretty good result to get that butte landscaping. Um, I'm not sure whether I can ask Simon to speak. Certainly, he could uh, use the remaining time to address the panel. Yeah, thank you. I think it's important to understand that 
a barrel maturation shed technically is a winery by definition. So this winery is like no other winery in existence in the valley that I know in that it does not crush grapes. It does not receive grapes, it does not create a grape mark, there is no fermentation. It is purely for storage of wine barrels, for blending of wine, and for storage of finished goods uh, and packaging supplies. The footprint we have requested to increase, uh, but we are not changing the traffic. Traffic use would be consistent with the first stage that was approved. We are purely expanding the site so we can have a, an operation that better conforms to WorkSafe SA. We want to spread the barrel racks out so we can get a scissor lift down the side of each barrel rack so we can top in place. And we want to have at least four metres between the pallet racking for, for safe forklift work. I would also mention that the forklift that we have is battery operated, so there is no, no um, increased noise from a traditional forklift um, and, and that there is no change to traffic from the original plan. So I'm happy to answer questions, but I think everything has been written already. Thank you. Panel members, do you have any questions? Yes, Rob. Um, I'm just trying to reconcile, so with the, 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 the difference between pallet spaces and barrels, so it's, it's 170 up to 320. Uh, I think that was page 74 of Peter's report, um, Peter Gosser's report. It does then state, uh, the 10,500 litres per year has gone down from the 12,800 litres per year. But then it goes on and talks about 656 barrels. Um, and if I've done my arithmetic right, I think it's 225 litres in a barrel, which is around about 150,000 litres. And understanding that's over um, the Schengen 21 requirements, it's not a winery, it's not production, so that's, that's, that's why it's not been referred to. Yeah, I get that. Um, I guess I'm just trying to reconcile what actual number is it. Okay, so the barrels we use are called hogsheads. They hold 300 litres, um, and per vintage, we are staying within the confines of the 50 tonnes equivalent allowed. So again, we're a little bit different. We have some quite mature wines in, in part of our portfolio. So we have five years of bulk wine stock at present. We have wine from 2016 to 2020 in barrels. So that's where the increased number of barrels comes from. And then obviously, as you go through the year, you package product. So we have bottled wine going back to 2004. So we have significant museum inventory. And then part of those additional pallet spaces will be for dry goods of products to be bottled. And they'll have their own individual pallet rack rather than being stacked on top of each other, which they currently are in, in the shed that has been approved. And as, as is always the norm, the pallet that you want is on the bottom down the back, and it just is so inefficient to work that way. So we, we are looking to have every pallet in its own unique place on a, on a warehouse racking system. And then, like I said, for the wine barrels, we're looking to separate them so we can have a scissor lift to go down in between each stack of barrels therefore decreasing the volume of barrels we can have in the approved shed since we need more space. So just to summarise, if I may, Bruce, so the 50 tonne limit relates to barrel and bottle uh, inside, is that correct? Or? 50 tonne per annum? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have stock going from 2004 to 2020 yeah. okay. within that 50 tonne equivalent limit. Now just to assist us, this is your wine that you've produced? Yes, it is. And you've got a winery elsewhere that actually produces that wine? Uh, no, I contract process contract at, a, at another winery here in Anguston. So all crushing and fermentation takes place at that facility. Um, and then we, we receive bulk wine, post vintage, to be put into barrels. So there's no creation of solids, as was inferred previously. Um, it is purely for blending of, of wines that have been matured in barrels. So is this a strategy really to be able to produce aged wine? No, we've we've to some degree. We've had we've had that strategy in place for some time. We are 
we are attempting to have a safer working condition. So that's why we need a bigger footprint. Panel members, do you have any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now resume our consideration of the application. Jake, is there any further to report? Um, no, other than uh, just reiterating what's been said, is obviously the panel has previously considered to um, ensure application, which was treated as not complying, um, given this was an uh, extension of that. This application does have to be treated as not complying itself, so um, yeah, other than that, um, there is a, so. Thank you. One of the problems we do face is, of course, an extension of an existing use. And unfortunately, the courts in South Australia have not really helped us in giving any guidance as to how far you can extend an existing use, which makes this quite difficult. Um, so we have to consider, in effect, how much we would allow an existing use to extend. Panel members, any comments or questions? Yes, Rob. So, um, so question to Jake in terms of the noise. So, in um, uh, Peter Gossel's report on page 76, part four, it's about noise management. There is only three or four, four sentences there. So, obviously, in your assessment, you're comfortable with that, um, covering all the noise or potential noise issues. And also, noting, I guess, for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, the two closest to so I didn't put representation into the uh, to the east and the uh, south. Is that correct? Um, I'll just start the question there. Sir. Yeah, so with respect to the first question in terms of noise management, obviously um, uh, Peter Goss from Marcher Environmental has provided those comments. Um, and part of my deliberations in that was um, that it wasn't um, uh, proposing any additional traffic movements and those sort of things. There may be some. Um, incidents will increase, but um, not considered um, uh, excessive in that regard. Um, that may be something the panel wishes to, to get further clarification on with the designers. Um, in terms of the closest um, dwellings not putting in representations, um, there is a dwelling on the uh, southern side um, which didn't put in re uh, representation. Um, and obviously across the road, um, was a representation but not electing to speak. Um, I think there may be a few across the road though, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course, um, they would still have to comply with the uh, Environment Protection Act requirements on noise. Uh, yeah. and that is a separate act of parliament which does control noise and people can obviously uh, complain to that in respect of noise. So the applicant obviously has to take that into consideration in any development that they propose, of course. Any further questions or comments? Just, just a comment. Yes, right. Condition 9 does pick up on the noise from the latest that we the general requirement. Now, any further comments or questions? Yes, David. Uh, I'm just looking at conditions 11 and 12 that say um, the removal of solid waste and deliveries uh, should be between 7am and 7pm. Uh, could we add there to both of those conditions not on Sundays or public holidays? You might just get an indication if we were to include that condition and if we were to approve it, of course, <coughs> um, would the applicant have any objection to that? No, I don't. That's fine. Okay. Can that be noted? Okay. Now also, of course, the first consultant who spoke to us also recommended some conditions should we approve of it. Perhaps I can have your comment on those. Yeah, um, I quite like the condition about no crushing, no bottling. I think the extra condition there would be, if Simon's happy with that condition, uh, we put I'm more than happy to have a clean work inside. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, look, it is confusing that, the, that it comes out of the category of winery. That's right. In my opinion, it's not. By, uh, by definition, it is, but I, it yeah. is confusing, yes. So we, we had to call it a winery, and it's, it's not a winery in the, in the common sense of the word. What process? Yeah. Mm. Doesn't figure the change of 21, I think. 
If there's any assistance, Peter Goss's report clearly shows what does happen on site and what does not happen on site. So I'm happy for that to be the reference point. Okay, good. Now, is there anything else that panel members wish to? Uh, I think picking up on Grant's comment, condition four may need to be tweaked from whether it said rather than winery processing, whether it said winery storage operations or something like that. Something that I think that, uh, that's a valid point, should we approve of it, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure yet about the noise thing. Um, I'm actually sitting on the fence here because the weather is, well, there should be an acoustic report, so I think that might fix you know, potential noise from car parking issues and whether that should be cited where it is, um, and whether Peter can do that or not. Um, so it's not too much further expense for the applicant, but um, I'm happy to see where the way the vote goes, and I'm just putting that comment out there for myself. I'm happy with those condition changes that the residential suggested, but um, yeah, I think I think those four sentences perhaps aren't enough on the noise, potential noise, rather than saying it'll be okay, and it's not actually an acoustic. Well, if Peter's an acoustic engineer, that's fine, but actually just to do a few readings and um, um, in noting as well that the two closest um, well, in the future, maybe not just a presentation. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of not quite decided on that one yet. But. Yes, Grant. No, it isn't. So, if you're heading down that way for an acoustic report, is it worth getting a layout plan to show pallet racking, the number of barrels, to clarify the numbers as well? Um, that could well, that the acoustic book could help decide how the uh, it's probably all yeah, cool settled in Simon's head, but how that actually can be quantified with a bit of data. And I think that'll help me get this one over the line. Any further comments? I'm quite happy with most of it, other than the two points that have just been raised. They're the ones that are concerning me, particularly with the noise. I just, I would like clarification on that. On the noise? Yep, most definitely. We do have an option here. You can obviously deal with the recommendation. I think or you could propose a, a motion to the effect that it be deferred for that uh, noise report. The noise in the layout. The noise in the layout. I think for me that would settle the four hectares in order. So it's actually going to meet noise requirements in much smaller. I'm in your hands how you now wish to proceed. Well, I move to lay it on the table for that until further information is received. Yeah. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Rob. Any further discussion? The motion is to be deferred for those two matters to be addressed. I'm actually quite comfortable with the rest of it, and I don't know whether it needs some direction from staff, but I'm having to delegate that to staff, or in the new world we live in, does it need to come back to CAP? In other words, you could put it as a reserve matter. No, I'd rather not. Yeah, That's stretching a bit, I'd it? rather not. I like the suggestion, but not. <laughs> No, I think that's putting too much onus on the staff. I think we've yeah, got to have those calls. Yeah, I think okay. it's been a matter that it has rep as representation. So. Yeah. so we now have a motion which is to be deferred for those two matters. Any further discussion, I'll put the motion. Those in favour, those against, it is deferred. We now move on to the next matter for consideration, which is. Six point two, which is the uh, proposal is change of, of use to include parking of three trucks to a maximum MRV size liquid waste removal trucks. Now, it, uh, it was dealt with previously by the panel, which they deferred it for additional information. Janine, is there any further to report? Um, no, nothing further to report other than uh, what is in the report before you. The panel has previously seen this application, as Greg said, and agreed to proceed to assess. Um, after that decision, the applicant submitted a statement of effect and it went out on public notification with no receipt of um, any objections and now it's come back to the panel for a decision. 
I'm happy to take questions on it. And the applicant's um, consultant, um, Michael, is in the gallery. Michael Richardson, yes. questions yes. to um, forward to him. Panel members, any questions or comments? Yes, Deidre. Janine, have there been any complaints about the activity? We have received no complaints about this activity. And as you can see, the use started around 1996 when the current owners um, bought the property. Is it possible to, would you consider approving it with fairly stringent conditions about how it was used? If they hadn't removed all the vines, I might have had come back to you with a different recommendation. It was the fact that the primary production has been completely abandoned on the site, which um, is a big concern to me. It's clear that by not receiving any complaints and no objections, that the neighbours aren't being particularly impacted um, by the proposal. It's more that um, it's the primary production of the Rossa Valley region and primary production is no longer occurring on that site. Again, of course, we've got a situation where the activity is an, almost an existing use. It's not a very big block. I don't know where the vines would be that practical. Again, we face with these small allotments which are dotted through the valley. Yes, Rob. Subsequent question to Deirdre's I had when it started was it one bucket, two buckets, or two buckets, or two buckets, or two buckets? Oh, I can't answer that. Might, for you and Michael. Yeah, I might refer that to uh, Mr. Richardson if he'd like to assist us. Um, thanks, Mr. Presiding Member and members. Um, look, it's three, uh, three trucks. Um, whether all of those trucks operate all of the uh, all of the time, like a lot of businesses, um, there's ebbs and flow of businesses during the course of the year. Um, but as we stated quite clearly when we were here, when the uh, panel was determining to proceed with an assessment um, and ask a question in terms of the number of the trucks, it's clearly defined that that is the limit on the number of trucks that we want to park there. Um, and you couldn't have any more without having to come back for a subsequent approval at some point. It would clearly be well. No, this allotment can't uh, accommodate any more because there would be an impact. But I do note, and I think we've stated it in our statement of effect, that the the, own, the applicant who resides on the property um, keeps a number of passenger vehicles and race cars that they use as a hobby uh, on the property. Now that is obviously <coughs> ancillary and subservient to the use of the property as a rural residential property. It doesn't require approval, but the impact of keeping you know, 10 passenger vehicles, a few race cars on property, it really isn't going to be that different to keeping a few trucks on the property. These trucks leave the property once a day, come back to the property once a day, they don't, plus they're liquid waste trucks, they can't bring any waste to the, uh, the property, we're not seeking approval as a waste transfer station. So we're talking about six truck movements a day, they go in the morning, they come back in the afternoon, they've been pumped out and cleaned elsewhere. They're just vehicles being stored on this property. The property is six and a half thousand square metres. It had 2,700 square metres of vines that were removed over a decade ago. Even if we're really optimistic and said 10 or 12 tonnes a hectare of grapes is coming off them, they're not paying the mortgage. Um, removing vines also isn't development. So it's not something the council has control over anywhere. So the use really is a use without any significant degree of intensity. It is three trucks, very clearly. Panel members, you have any further questions of the consultant? Well, yes, and right. there is really the trucks don't bring waste back to site and they're no, cleaned they off them. site, no. everything's cleaned off. Yep. Yeah. You bring one litre yeah. of waste back to site, it becomes a waste transfer station. It's a use that requires an EPA licence, um, it's a use that requires approval as a separate discrete <coughs> use. So, no, they cannot bring any waste back to the site. So really yes, just a question. We've got waste transfer depot. Is that really the lead probably wrong as the current use? Yes. 
Oh, they, they say they're the trucks, but they're looking right through. Sure, it's yes. really truck parking. The, yeah. the, the, the nature of the business sense of the presiding over, the nature of the business of the trucks is really not relevant to the, the application. What's relevant is the three trucks up to MRV in size. That's the definition, really, of what the impact will be, whether they are waste trucks or tippers or any sort of uh, truck. The same size truck being parked on the side, the impact of those trucks, irrespective of what it is they transport, is going to be. Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, my, my question is more about what the three trucks are essential, they can't operate with two, um, and whether that would then be another question for Janine about whether two is more supported by that. I dare say, in my answer to my question, three has to be kept what works. Three obviously is working. Yeah. <laughs> two won't. That's right. Panel, any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Now, panel members, any comments or questions? Of course, parking of trucks is something that is often dealt with uh, in rural living areas and areas outside of, uh, of township areas. Not uncommon. Um, you know that with liquid waste is, but no, that's right. Oh. Sort of is it's removing waste or wandering, so if we didn't have their service, there is some, there is, there is some wind there, yes. yes. Right. Question for you, Janine, too. This quite large pile of tyres, 7 by 3 by 2.5, that's pretty big. I think Michael big. just answered that. In Just a racing. In relation to the uh, the owner's hobbies. That's a lot of tyres. Mm. And that was at a point of time. I don't know if they're still that many there on the side. Now, panel members, do you have any further questions or comments? We do have a recommendation. That's contained on pages 105 to 106. Bruce, in my opinion, that I can see where Janine's coming from, but I also look at it and think we've got three trucks on somebody's property. It's not really doing any damage. If there's a problem with the storage, the way the tyres are being stored, I don't know. Is there a regulation that can make them put something over, put it in a shed? I don't know. All I know is that I can look at this and think, no, I'm not going to refuse it. Just before I take a motion, yes, Rob. Um, just I guess I'm thinking the same, but has Janine got any possible conditions that could be applied for us to be supported? I think if um, you were going to support it, we'd add the sort of conditions about um, the operation times and those sorts of things. So we'd add a condition about limiting the number of trucks, the operation times that um, the vehicles are moving on the property. Um, we, we could add those sorts of conditions if there's anything out of left field that you're thinking of that you don't normally see in one of our reports, let us know. Well, I think if you try to restrict it on the weekends, you might run into strike when one of those trucks is absolutely needed to mm. combat some issue that's a seals area. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, I that, don't think. That's I, an interesting question. I don't think that, that under these circumstances, if it's for the waste removal trucks, as Delhi. Uh, in the proposal. I'm looking at it thinking it's not a major problem. The report does look at noise and yeah. there is no concerns about noise. Obviously not with them. other people around the place not complaining. That's how I look at it. But I just think we just got to apply a bit of common sense and say, look, it's not really a major problem. So again, talking about conditions, is it worth conditioning it again that no waste is brought back to site, no truck washing on site? Um, and then it gives us some, um, well, that's fine. Some strength to, um, yeah, concerned with the MRV size, so then the percentage would increase on which is part of this compliance for, yep. Now, I'm getting an indication from the uh, applicant's representative that that's acceptable if we were to approve of it, Richard. 
Well, that's how I feel about it. Uh, with those minor conditions, I'm prepared You're to moving move fee approved, approved subject approved. to those conditions. Now, of course, one of the things that uh, it is non-complying, yep. so we so still we need the concurrent approval of the commission yes. because it was lodged before the 25th of May. So yep. it still needs a concurrent approval of the commission. Okay, moved. Is there a second that? Ruth, Should oh. I read back? Yes. Um, no waste to be brought back to the site. Um, truck size limited to what was that? MRV. That's um, MRV size. Yes. Um, three trucks. To three trucks and no truck washing on the site. Now, have I got a second that? I think Rob was first. I, I'd just also say happy for most to be applied, but it might be in the general section 45 where there is no steps. Whilst they're not conditions to enforce, but they, they are, they they are a reminder to the yeah. applicant, yes. Okay, I do have a motion now, which is to approve subject to the concurrence of the Commission, to be approved subject to conditions and notes. Those in favour? Once again, it is approved subject to conditions and notes. We now move on to the next item, which is 7.1. The applicant is the Brown Family Vineyards Proprietary Limited and CJ Arms. The Torrance Title Land Division to create one additional allotment. I better. Be, and as I continue on, of course. Um, uh, Richard has indicated the conflict of interest in this matter and advised accordingly and will leave. I will. I would have stopped before we had oh, that's uh, considered right. the matter, Richard. <laughs> so if you'd like to remove yourself. And continuing it, it's a Torrance title land division to create one additional allotment. It's 981 Lake Pass Road, Vine Vale. It's in amalgamation in rural landscape protection zone and the division part of it is primary production Brossa Valley zone. The amalgamation part of this particular application of course is not development. But the division is a non-complying and again would need the concurrence of the commission. Uh, it's a category three but the task before the panel is because it is non-complying is decide whether the application be refused or whether it continues through to further uh, council assessment. Jenny, is there any further to report? Um, the panel saw the previous iteration of this application that was subsequently withdrawn. Um, what we see is different this time is the um, plan of division in that more land is being associated with the existing winery, thereby meeting the, uh, the four hectares uh, of vineyard to be associated with the winery. But the applicant's um, consultant is here, yes. Mr. Burns, if you'd like to ask any questions of him, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions. Panel members, any comments or questions? I'm a bit gun-shy with the previous one where the gap obviously was refused, as you can see later in the agenda. Um, I've actually attached those uh, attachment to them. Yeah, well, as well. Um, I thought I'd seen that really thought I was happy to, to see, but I'm not so sure now about getting fast hopes up and spending the money and then we don't know the position. Scat, because I'm, ha I'm happy to ask the applicant whether they had Discussions with SCAP and SCAP will probably say nothing because they're not on the committee yet. And see what the council decision is. Mr. Burns might be able to assist us with that. I'm Thank you. The point's been raised, if I may, because uh, I remember. Uh, and you made the comment too uh, in your opening remarks about SCAP's concurrence is required. Um, SCAP's concurrence is not required for this application. Um, what happened on the, the 14th of May <coughs> was that uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic being um, it's called the COVID-19 Emergency Response Further Measures Amendment Act of 2020 was passed. And that act amendment uh, applied to Crown Development, but it also applied to non-compliant developments to the effect that 
SCAP concurrent, so any application lodged after the 14th of May is not required. So in other words, the difference between that old application that uh, you've been that is mentioned in the report and uh, the plan that was mentioned, uh, a big difference there and now is that that application did require SCAP concurrence, this application does not. Is it in Lord effect, is this a new application? Sorry? Is this a new application? It is a fresh application. Okay. And, it was after, and it was lodged after, after the date? Correct. Okay, so I'll... Can I raise something? Yes, the certainly. Character Preservation Act, which is a different act, not the Development Act, still requires concurrence. That is, uh, that is arguable, but in any event, SCAP's concurrence for the merits of this yes. application is not required. So SCAP will need to concur under the Character Preservation Act and not under the Development Act. But normally, does it always go to under? It just goes to one body, of course. So normally, and you'll see in attachment two mm -hmm. that um, the SCAP came back and determined not to concur under both the Character Preservation Barossa Valley Act 2012, Section 35.3b1, and the oh, sorry, Section 82, and Section 35.3b1 of the Development Act. So after that day, we would still need to go back, if the panel was of the mind to approve, it would still need to go back to the SCAP under Section A2 of the Character Preservation Act. Concurrence is no longer required under the Development Act. And that's all I'm here to argue. I, I, to be honest, uh, presiding member, I don't think we should be sitting around this table at this early stage of this application. Uh, talking uh, the legal nuances uh, as to uh, whether or not it does go to SCAP. I'm simply here tonight on behalf of my client to argue the merits of this proposal at the commencement of a fresh application that has been made. It is a different application, by the way, uh, just so that I can round off on this issue, significantly different in that 13 hectares of vines will be attached now to the winery application, whereas previously, previously there wasn't. And the other allotment, that is the allotment proposed allotment 30, will also comprise a uh, big yard allotment of 13 hectares. And that's consistent with the development plan. SCAT, in its refusal to concur, raised that particular issue. So we've addressed the concerns that were raised by SCAT. And again, I don't want to confuse the debate tonight about uh, the merits or otherwise of receiving the SCAT concurrence. I'm simply here tonight to argue the merits of this application, which this panel found did have merit previously. I think this application has got as much, if not more, merit now. We simply want the panel tonight to make a decision to proceed on the merits of this application. Point taken. Well, we're not asking for a decision tonight, no. simply to proceed. With the whether, it's, whether it has some merit to Correct. proceed. That's all we're asking yeah. for. No, thank you. So that's, what, that's the position we're faced with. Um, I'm happy to move. Well, any further discussion? Yes, sir. Right. Question for Janine for um, the recommended refusal to serve as RQ Songs. I'm comfortable with one end because I don't create false expectations, but by the same token, we're um, I'm just moving closer, not close enough to being supportive of subject support assessment. Um, um, with the reasons for the recommendation for refusal last time, you were going to look at the weighting of those reasons. The four hectares was probably the, um, had the least weight in um, my concerns. So the other uh, re reasons for refusal had greater weight for me, um, but they have met that principle now. So I think that, that is something further on the side of the my concern is still that way. What I think of it. Well, our task tonight really is whether it has enough merit to proceed. And if we allow it to proceed, of course, that's no guarantee that a future panel will approve it, of course. I, cer I certainly get to Janine's position on it. Um, and I think I get where the applicant wants to end it, even though it's a little messy one. Um, but I, I certainly spoke in favour of the last year, so probably needing to look at the grant as well. I'm happy to second on that basis of proceed. Which is 
before assessment. Now I have a mover and a seconder. Mover up, second is grant. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, it, that it proceeds to further assessment. Any further discussion? I put the motion. Those in favour? Those against? It proceeds to further discussion. And we might bring Richard back into the room. If I may also make a comment, though, panel members, um, I found the, let the plan of subdivision quite confusing, and particularly using pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Pieces that don't have any legal status. I, I, found, I found it quite confusing, actually. The pieces, uh, I'm sorry to speak from the gallery here, yeah. but, but the pieces do have legal status. Uh, two pieces comprising one allotment is, is now in law and entrenched in law. No, they don't have a legal status. As for not. Hmm? As for not. Two pieces. Two pieces forming one allotment. On, on the ground to the community. Oh, oh, the 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 right, but they. There's three allotments. Yeah. Okay. You know, we've dealt with this matter, so we'll proceed to the next matter. And there's 7.2, the applicant is J.D. Lewis, Torrance Title Land Division, create one additional allotment. It's a 19D Goldfield Road, Cockatoo Valley. It's a rural living zone, precinct 31, spec road. Now, it's again, it's non-complying. Uh, when was the application lodged? On the 20th of April, so obviously still needs the concurrence. Again, the task before the panel is whether it should proceed to an assessment. Janine, any further to report? Um, can I direct you to the plan on page 195? Uh -huh. So the picture at the top of the page. Yes. And um, it looks at the different precincts and the primary production zone to give you a context of the different allotment densities in this locality. Mm. So as you go towards the top of the page, Precinct 21, Cockatoo Valley, yeah, and Precinct stuff. 22, Cockatoo Valley South, they have smaller allotment requirements. And then as you head to the primary production zone and south of this proposal, you've got much larger allotment requirements um, in this area. So you'll note that in this precinct, there's, um, as per my report, I said there's about 20% of the allotments are undersized. And a lot of those allotments are adjoining this one and are right up in that northern section of the precinct. So I do have some concerns and that um, if we if this was ultimately agreed it would be spreading that <coughs> undersized allotments further into this precinct, but they are right next door uh, to this allotment. So um, hence my recommendation to at least proceed to assess at this stage. Thank and you. you'll also note that the gas line crosses this property mm. as well. Yeah. It's a rather a rugged. It's a bit hard to tell, but the uh, the gas line sort of runs, if you come up from uh, Williamstown Road, it sort of runs halfway through that clear area there, which is why the access currently at the moment comes through this back. Um, mm. Yeah, through that back corner to avoid vehicles having to cross the gas line. Yeah, I thought I had a lot of trouble with the gas going the width they had to bring it to it. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that the gas line is in the no, no. spot. No. But given the the house that's there at the moment, I think that was um, I think the only thing there was built around 1974. And any future plan should the division occur is likely to be either down close to the Williams Town Road area or, um, or back further to the back of the property. But that's something that they'll have to deal with if it gets approved and if we get an application for dwelling at a later date. But um, previously, uh, the owner of the property did have an approval to pull down the existing dwelling and replace it. And it looks like they've decided to go ahead. Any further questions or comments? Yes, Grant. 
in the table a lot at 82. It's got 28, 23 square metres. Is that actually right? <laughs> on page 182, 3 square metres. There are. Um, yeah, where no. are we talking? 5.36 hectares? Actually, it is 9.36 hectares. So that's a, an error. error. I, I think. You know, when you hit formatting and yeah, uh, yeah it totally it's changes a, the number altogether. Work out <laughs> it's actually 4.10 hectares. So 81 is 4.10 hectares, and the other one is a very similar to match as well. Any further questions Sorry. or comments? 5.69. You do have a recommendation that's contained on page 199. Move, Rob, is there a second? Second to Deidre? Is there any further discussion? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, those against. It is sent to the council for further assessment. Now we now move on to the next item, which is actually 9.1. 8.1 was deferred applications, and at that stage there were no deferred applications. This is State Planning Commission concurrent applications, and there is a, a number of applications there. Um, and the latter ones are, there's one still outstanding amongst those other, which was the winery one. The impact wastewater. Yeah. Yes. Is still outstanding. So it's, it's still outstanding? Yeah. Okay. All the others Panel members, any questions as to the matters? Yes. A question. Uh, that one for Brown family, should that have uh, loaded on their withdrawal as well? Um, possibly. Just for highlighting. Yep. So that's what they've done. Yep. Because hmm. now we're looking at the other one. Yeah. Yeah, don't want confusion. It's not enough as it is. Yeah. I mean, it is their decision. We're recording their decisions here. Yeah, that's right. That's the yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's a good yeah. point. Okay. Somebody like to move that the matter move, Deidre? Uh, seconded, Rob. We receive those in favour, those against. It is received. There are no appeals outstanding at this point in time. We still have the appeal for Washington Street. Yes, yes. So that hasn't come back to the meeting. Is there any? You haven't got a, a date set for a hearing? Um, the, we're supposed to go back to the ERD court in September. So um, they, uh, the court has a lot of time to come back to us with new plans. So hopefully we'll see them at the next meeting. Okay. Okay, we move on to item 10, which is reports. 10.1, planning reform update. And that is in matters related to... I think I'm just looking now for it. Yeah. Gary, would you like to yeah. enlighten us on yeah. what's happening with the new legislation, etc.? Uh, we thought we were an opportunity, obviously, now to get closer and closer to the commencement of the Phase 3 Councils for Plan Design Code to at least put on the agenda a regular item to brief you on changes that uh, impact your role as, as independent members of the panel. Uh, obviously, we are going through the process at the moment, Council, to do the expression of interest for the new panel commencing October, uh, but we still think it's worthwhile having these conversations with the current panel. So today, I just want to brief you on the professional accreditation scheme, which obviously impacts the independent members, not the Council member, and just uh, highlighting, obviously, that uh, as part of that accreditation process, you must be accredited, obviously, to be a panel member. And you must maintain your accreditation on an annual basis through your uh, renewal. And the key thing is, is obviously, is that uh, the annual registration and the uh, professional development required is your own personal responsibility uh, of that of council to do so. So that was one key thing that we just wanted to highlight today. And for the purposes, I have an old table circulated that there is some information that has been received by council regarding some of the training that is available through the local government association. So I'll just circulate that uh, for, for your information. Is there something in the next couple of weeks? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but there is... Uh, 
some training that's the training that's proposed is obviously to focus on some of the key uh, requirements of the accreditation. Uh, so you would need to sort of look at how that fits into your availability for training. I don't have a copy of that, so it's just for curiosity. So, oh, oh. There you go. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to highlight, so that's obviously for your information, the other thing I want to highlight, we also received uh, an email uh, from the department just confirming, again, as, as independent members, uh, that the local government mutual liability scheme will cover you uh, while you are sitting as a member of the panel. So again, uh, I've got a copy of that uh, email for your information so that you have it uh, for your records. Uh, you know, where you stand from a legal perspective. So again, it is good that uh, the department and minister have made the appropriate amendments uh, through regulation to allow the scheme to, to cover you as an independent member. Just off the track there a little bit, um, do they make any comment about regional panels? Uh, I believe they do. And is that just a, something that may be members of regional panels? Yeah, it'd be worth just having a read, but I think it does. So that's all I have for this uh, meeting. Uh, but like I said, we will try to bring uh, something back to the <coughs> meeting as we get closer. One of the key things we're going to ask you to help us through is obviously work through the delegations uh, with the new templates that have been released, uh, because obviously those powers and functions come directly to you as a panel, uh, no longer delegated from council, so we have to work out what uh, types of applications that you would prefer to see and what ones would be delegated to the assessment manager. I understand there's been some, some councils have already, panels have already adopted and there's been some recent changes. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. yes. But some will have to go back to some of those other councils to deal with that. Mm -hmm. cool. so I'm happy to take any other questions. Any questions, members? Uh, has anybody tried to fill the form in yet, electronic form? Oh, it's <coughs> not very clear. I had trouble. It was it, it was unstable, and I rang, and I got an automatic reply. <laughs> Give and I, I had to put a code that. in to actually speak to somebody, which I you know I spoke to uh, what's her name. Uh, and she was very helpful, mm -hmm. and uh, I said I the, the form's not stable. I can't, when I open it. Oh, so she tried. She says you're right. So I had to make the form up. <laughs> then you had to divide it up against um, the different avenues of training that you do, as well. Doesn't say that clearly. So I had to change my form and make out other columns. Now, is there any other business? Do you want to like that moved? Certainly. Can we move that report? Move Grant, seconded. Deidre? Any discussion? Those in favour? We accept that report. Okay, I don't think there's any other business. I thank uh, panel members and council staff for the, uh, for, the, for the meeting and I formally close it. Yeah,